Coming up on this week's show, the cutest version of Street Fighter 2 we've ever seen. Some big time splitters rewind news. And we talk Thief, System Shock 2 and Bioshock with Ken Levine. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our incredible friends at Bitmap Books, who've actually, can we have a bit of a round of applause, just celebrated their 10th birthday. Come on, guys. Happy birthday to Sam and the team at Bitmap Books, who publish an incredible 29 books as well. And to celebrate their birthday this month, why don't you have a look at their website, bitmapbooks.com, including their incredible new N64 a visual compendium filled with over 150 titles that defined the N64. Check that out on the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 423, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And very nice to have you hanging out with us on the podcast every single Friday. Takes you back to the golden age of video games. Brings you up to speed on all the big happenings in the world of retro from over the last seven days. And of course, brings you a very special guest on the second half of the podcast. More on that coming up soon. But can we just say a very warm welcome back to Joe Fox? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I had a couple of weeks after in there. I was was, uh, wondering if you'd you'd listen to the episode with Gareth that we did last week. I uh, What did did you think of his his job? I did. I did. Uh, I couldn't think of anybody better. Um, Gareth was actually our first ever patron supporter. Wow. Um, And yeah, I just thought... So I went away with the family for a couple of weeks, so... The guys very kindly recorded a week ahead with me and then I had to miss a week and uh, we asked Gary, Gareth to step in and uh, yeah, I think he did a wonderful job. Um, put a big smile on my face. I actually listened to the episode this morning uh, on my walk up to the dentist uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I, I was a little bit worried actually because I was like, some of these people we've had on probably a little bit better than me. Yeah, you, <laughs> we, we were thinking that. job's yeah. under threat now. Yeah, we yeah. thought we might not invite you back. You know, Gareth was up for everything. Yeah, so that's it. I'm never going on holiday again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, thank you so much, Gareth, uh, for stepping in. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for just carrying on with the show, guys. Yeah. Know, the show must go on every week. Yeah, well, we look forward to getting our presents that you've uh, no doubt bought back from your, your travel oh, yeah, for us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, we'll get those after the show, I'm <laughs> sure. Uh, but, of course, lots of retro gaming news stories to bring you up to speed on. We'll chat about that in just a moment and an amazing guest. And uh, now that we are into April, that does mean, you know, clocks have gone forward here in the UK. We are officially into British summertime. I say looking at the rain pouring outside my window right now. (laughs) But that means we're getting close to uh, summer events. And, of course, the big one that we're excited about is Ravi's second ever massive Amiga show, Kickstart 2, that is coming up. What's the dates again? End of June? Yeah, so it's on uh, June the 29th and the 30th at Meadow Lane Stadium in Nottingham. And, uh, yeah, this is the biggest dedicated Amiga show in the world this year. So um, it's going to be pretty mad. I've... Like, gone all out on it. Um, there's a few of the details. We've got uh, announcements on the website, which is amigashow.com, and you can get tickets there. But uh, we've got 18 Amiga traders, so a huge <laughs> Amiga trader hall. And uh, we've got 10 different groups in the community space. So uh, community space is like a really cool space where you can jam, you can see machines, you can chat to people. That's also where the bar is. So you know, there's a lot of activity Yeah, going on in the community space. And then um, we've got uh, five special guests as well coming, which, uh, you know, John Shawler's coming over from America, hosting the event. Yeah, we've got Pete Cannon. He's going to be there. Um, Tony Warriner as well, who's, um, you know, beneath a Steel Sky Revolution software. Stu Cambridge from Sensible Software. We've also got Trevor Dickinson there from Aeon and... uh, you know, there's a lot of machines that are kind of being announced. Um, I think I counted three or four new forms of Amiga are going to be announced at the show um, that that we've been talking about. So it's going to be a, a news generating one. This is, and then we've got a music act as well, and uh, that that's a whole video game music night basically, which. Um, contains five acts, and that's going to go on till the late hours. But um, you know, David Wise of uh, Rare, who did, uh, of course, the soundtrack of Donkey Kong Country, is going to be headlining that. Uh, Pete Cannon, 
as well. You know, absolutely amazing producer and DJ uh, currently on Cool FM. He's going to be uh, dropping some insane Amiga beats and Hoffman as well and uh, Vogue Renee. So we've got a, a proper mad selection like... I wish I could come as a patron rather than organising it. <laughs> Can I come? Rather, you put it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been waiting for someone to do like an Amiga show in the UK because it's like been almost a decade, hasn't it, since the last one? So, uh, yeah, we're to kind of leave it to Ravi today. I wasn't going to do it myself. Yeah, that's why I did it. Like last year was kind of a proof of concept thing. And this year I'm, I'm going all out. Um, and it's mainly because when I was a kid, I used to go to these shows and they were the best thing ever. And they were completely mad, huge on a crazy scale, full of Amiga delusion. And <laughs> that's what this whole thing's about. So if you want to come along, just over two months to go until uh, Kickstart 02. Um, I know a lot of our patrons are traveling over as well for you from different parts of Europe too. So it's going to be nice. Oh, we've talk. got people coming from Australia. We've got uh, people coming from all over the world. Yeah, it's, it's going to be crazy. America as well. So we'll have a nice little retro hour meetup like we did last year. It was a lot of fun. So if you are coming along to our Kickstart, um, AmigaShow.com is a website to get your tickets. Many left, is it? Is it nearly? Yeah, we've, we've sold about half, and uh, but we've basically increased capacity. Um, so we, we've doubled our capacity. So um, we've sold about as much as last year. So if you were there last year, it, it was quite busy. Um, but we've got extra spaces this year, so it's going to be even more ramo and we've got a complete new uh venue which is a salt box bar in nottingham for the after party as well so uh that's going to be on a, a much bigger scale than it was before bring it on so uh, hopefully we'll see you there end of june um i'll link up the website in uh, this week's show notes if you want to get your tickets for that first big event of the summer right then we have got an amazing guest this week as well we're going to be talking about bioshock do you remember when you first played Bioshock? I know you were a big fan of it back in the day, Ravi. Oh, mind was blown. Like, um, to me, FPSs, uh, I do mention this in the interview, you know, some of them were were kind of just like military realistic simulators. And then going into like a, a fantasy world with Art Deco underwater, uh, you know, with such uh, characters and kind of um, entering this world that, that, that came alive that had just been you know, kind of running on its own underwater. Oh, it's, it's just fantastic. The whole style of it, the whole gameplay um, is is a masterpiece of a game. Yeah, I remember that was one of the early games I played on my Xbox 360. I hadn't had it long, I don't think, when I got hold of that, because I think I got my 360 in 2007. So it must have been a very similar time. Um, but I remember, yeah, the opening sequence, you know, when you like first go into the world of Rapture. Um, and then when you find out the game mechanics, like, you know, being genetically modified and when you see big daddy for the first time which uh, i won't spoil for people that might not have played the game uh, but yeah i mean an absolute legend of an fps game and today we're going to be talking to uh, the main man behind it ken levine's going to be joining us on the podcast yeah and, and ken's got such a great career you know um we, we are the retro hour so you know he's got some modern stuff but we don't totally focus on bioshock we go back all the way to his roots and uh, uh there's some absolutely interesting discussions in this one you know uh thief was a game uh that he worked on that was really interesting also system shock as well and uh, uh thief was one of the first ones to use the dark engine system shock was a follow-up that ken did uh system shock 2 uh and there's a kind of theme throughout all of his games of atmosphere of immersion and we explore the whole idea of where that came from and how it's influenced his game so much. Yeah, because I mean, he was a bit you know, obsessed, I'd say, with like civilization. Yes, yes, yes. And also uh, Ultima Underworld. So there are big influences on the direction that he went into in game development as well. Even talking about his early experiences, because he's really into um, electromechanical games. Yes, yeah. Which, uh, you know, when we ask people about their first gaming experience, we don't usually get that. We get, uh, you know, it's usually the arcade straight away. But uh, yeah, Ken, Ken absolutely loved them. And the whole kind of electromechanical thing kind of works well with Bioshock as well, doesn't it? But also we talk about his new project as well, Judas, which is uh, his latest title coming out. And we also talk about Bioshock Infinite as well. Yeah, so a really interesting guest. If you love those games and you want to hear more about, um, like sex, I think you know, anyone that loves Bioshock, 
I think they're going to be interested in his new game because yeah, it's totally. a, a spiritual successor to Bioshock, really, doesn't it? So we'll hear all about that with this week's special guest, Ken Levine. He's coming up on the podcast in around half an hour from now. But of course, you know the way the show works. First 30 minutes or so, that is when we basically have a bit of a geek out, isn't it? A bit of a natter about what's been happening in the world of retro gaming and tech over the last seven days. And uh, lots for you to catch up on, Joe. Have you been keeping an eye on this stuff while you've uh, been lazing around the pool? I have. Day and- I have a little yeah. bit. I have uh, been keeping an eye. I'm in all the groups and stuff on our Facebook, always seeing seeing what's coming out and stuff like that. Um, and plus, I had to look back and see what news you guys <laughs> spoke about last week, so I didn't double anything up. But yeah, this one, definitely caught my eye uh, and I'm sure it caught your eye as well Ravi Time Splitters Rewind has uh, re-emerged this last kind of week which I imagine is following the closure of Free Radical Designs in uh, December I think it was or November for those of you who don't know Time Splitters Rewind was a essentially a remake of the original Time Splitters games you know a HD remake which was actually a fan-made project, which has been in the works since 2013. They've been working on this. And it's essentially, uh, it's a group of developers who have just been making it themselves in their spare time. And, uh, you know, it picked up some traction online. And a few years ago, there was even a petition to make it an official release, you know, for a publisher to pick it up. And it had had like 50,000 signatures, you know, 50,000 backers. Um, But it just never came to fruition. and as you know, as many listeners are probably aware, it's because Time Splitters has been kind of in development hell for the last, what, like 15 years? Uh, yeah. With, yeah. And uh, I'm assuming when they actually announced there was going to be an official fourth Time Splitters game, they probably took a step back and said, well, Time Splitters Rewind is going to have to stop because we're probably going to get a, you know, a cease and desist on this or. So, well, it, yeah. it's interesting. I've looked into that. So, um, it's like you know we know free radical um, yeah they've, they've been trying to create a new time splitters for a long time and the studio disappeared recently yeah uh, which was really sad to see and you know yeah. we've seen some footage come out of the the new time splitters games well this one's as i said it's been going on for absolute years and it's mainly because it's a fan project yeah and they're kind of doing it for a free game you know it's not yeah. going to be a game that they're making any money on so it's all people's spare time that they're doing this with and seeing what they've created has been absolutely amazing. Now, Crytek were the original owners of uh, uh, the brand after, right. after free radical. Yeah. And they gave permission um, uh. to develop a time split mod using the cry engine, like an official mod to mm-hmm. these guys uh, years ago. And they basically said time splitters four was the ultimate goal of of the time splitters rewind team so they wanted to kind of get to that kind of you know feel and and era but also have all the elements of mm-hmm. uh, the older older time splitters within there um they had something where they were stuck with the cry engine because that was the agreement that crytek had kind of said and then they've managed to move on to the unreal engine but i think they've said at one point from what what i've found is that they may have to do a rebrand if right. if that hits it, but it's kind of worth being on that engine, you know, because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's such a powerful one compared to the Cry engine now. Because, um, you know, technology's moved on over that yeah. Yeah, whole yeah. time period that they've done it. But what they're actually asking for is, you know, they put out in 2022 that the game is uh, looking and feeling really close. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is final kind of wrap-ups and clean-ups that they need. But because they're a small team, it's all being done on love and passion. Yeah. They need some people to come in and help add that final kind of polish because mm-hmm. they they see that there's that time splitters um, kind of power vacuum at the moment and and they want to move into that space to please the fans and, um, yeah. you know, actually get it out as well because I'm sure being in development for that long is a, yeah. a, a quite a frustrating thing. Yeah, yeah, for 11 years they've been at this. Um, and like you say, that is just passion and love and they've been doing it all for free, you know, kind of like out of their own pocket. So like you say, they've done a video, essentially, you know, kind of like, a, you know, an army, we need you to join the force kind of thing. Um, and they're looking for people to wipe out bugs, um, kind of like technical designers, developers, 
anybody who's willing to help with the project who's you know kind of got industry uh knowledge um and you know it'd be interesting to see if anybody who was actually working at the new free radical studio what well, suddenly they out. get the whole free radical team <laughs> just yeah. going and joining um, yeah that would, yeah, be, that would, that, that would be amazing that's an interesting point though it's... because and i know because watching this update which from what i've seen is actually the first kind of news we've heard about this in about a year everyone kind yeah. of assumed that this was dead um, but then yeah. Jake Parr, who is the lead writer on this, he's put up this uh, new video. But he, he doesn't mention, I mean, I haven't seen a breakdown of who the team are, but from what I've seen in this update, they're people that were working in the games industry full time and doing this like on an evening and weekends. But the problem is that now the way the games industry is going, they basically can't afford the time yeah, to work on this You need a for team free. of like 200, don't you? Yeah. Mm. It, with huge developments like that you know it's hard to do as a, as a fan project so good on them though for you know putting the word out and getting it in the news like this again and looking at the video as well i mean i hadn't seen a few of the kind of more recent updates but i've got to say i mean you mentioned there ravi that it kind of does feel like it's pretty close looking at that yeah. gameplay footage i mean you know the worlds that they've made and that the graphics are jaw-dropping yeah, it, it, it's it's time splits, isn't it? It just looks awesome, and the, the the figures we've seen footage of all of these kind of like the new time splitters, and that looks amazing. I just want to play one of them, you know. <laughs> I think that's the frustration of everybody. Yeah, and it would be such a shame if this didn't make it out after thirteen years of you know people waiting for it. And oh man, just imagine getting hammered at yeah. the end of there with like <laughs> a, a change. Oh, that would just be awful. Or a take that. Mate, playing playing this is like a Christmas get together or something. Like I'm I'm watching it now and it it looks fantastic. And I think it's it is such a shame that the official one got closed down because of I just feel like the industry, you know, the kind of the stratosphere of FS, FPSs is, is crying out for like these fun party shoot 'em ups because obviously and it, it's just been yeah. Call of Duty and Battlefield and stuff for so long now. I mean, I know there's been other games. And there's been attempts at doing these like fun games, but I just don't think any of them have picked up the traction that Time Split has ever did. And it does worry me a bit that it's kind of based on an agreement with Crytek, who no longer exist. Mm. And now Time Split, uh, now Free Radical has been sold on. And it's like based on a loose agreement, you know, years ago. Um, it's it, 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 legal status. It's like, I think they want to get it finished and out there. Um, you know, because, yeah, I'd, I'd hate to see this get taken down. I guess worst case scenario, they could always rebrand it as, you know, something else, not time splitters and change their characters up a bit, you know. Time cutters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that there you go. Have that one on us. Um, so if you do want to get involved in it, if you uh, have got any industry experience, like like you said, they're looking for people to uh, test it out as well. Anyone that's um, got experience illustrating, animators, anyone that wants to get into the gaming industry, you know, they're saying this would look, you know, how amazing would this look on your CV? if you're trying to get into the gaming industry right now. So if you do want to get involved in this, um, they have got a Discord server where you can get a hold of the uh, the team uh, if you'd like to join them as well and uh, get a look at the, the development so far. We would love to see this happen. So if you've got any interest in playing Time Splitters Rewind and they're helping them get it finished, I'll link that up in the show notes as well, crossing everything that happens. Now, we have been giving quite a lot of love to the Commodore Plus 4 on the podcast recently, you know, which was my first computer. Um, just feel like, you know, the homebrew scene on that has been really active recently. But a couple of years ago, it seemed like the, the Amstrad was getting all the love. And uh, it turns out, actually, there have been a few interesting developments in the world of Amstrad again recently. We mentioned that Lord Sugar has uh, bought back the brand, uh, going to be turning it into a digital marketing company. So it wasn't all that exciting when we actually drilled down into that. Uh, but there have been some great new homebrew developments on the Amstrad scene recently, including this, possibly the cutest version of Street Fighter we've ever seen. I really love the look of this. So this is a another fan-made project coming to the Amstrad, um, and it is a uh, version of Street Fighter 2, uh, which will be called Mighty Street Fighter. Um, and for those of you who don't know, there is a version of Final Fight, which is obviously also a Capcom game as well as Street Fighter, and is set in the same universe as Street right. Fighter and was originally going to be a sequel to the original Street Fighter, but then they made it its own kind of game and franchise. Um, that Final Fight has a version of it called Mighty Final Fight for the NES. And that was kind of like a stripped down uh, version of Final Fight where you played as little chibi anime kind of versions of the characters. 
and that's famously become a very rare, expensive game in America. And I don't, I'm okay. not sure if it ever came out in the UK. Anyway, uh, you know, there was Pocket Fighters, um, you know, in the 90s and stuff, and kind of these like little kid versions of Street Fighter, you know, which was done on like the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation 1. But we never really saw the original kind of Street Fighter 2 in this version. And I mm. think this looks fantastic. So Mighty Street Fighter, which is coming to the uh, Amstrad, um, is essentially a homage to that, you know, Mighty, <laughs> Mighty Final Fight, where all the characters are these little chibi versions. Seeing little Blanca um, as a chibi, as actually looks so cute, doesn't he? <laughs> they look so cute, um, and I think you know that kind of takes away the theme of it and the look of this game is actually taking away because so far it is just a video of a demo, um, yeah. and you know there's eight characters on there. You have got Ryu, Ken, uh, E Honda, Chun Li, uh, Zangief, Blanca, uh, Gail, and Dalsim. So the original Street Fighter Two lineup that was playable, as well as the bosses in there as well as 10 different levels to play on. Um, and I think graphically, this looks fantastic because I'm sat here talking about like, oh yeah, it's the chibi version. It looks great. It's a homage to Final Fight. Kind of forgetting what this is actually running on. And it looks great. Yeah. It, it looks uh, absolutely fantastic. It's running really well. And they've got a lot of the moves. And also, yeah. to, to be honest, like uh, this runs better than like Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo on the Amiga, which is just <laughs> a really bad port. But it looks, yeah, it looks playable, you know. And uh, it's on the CPC and also the GX 4000 as well. I, I really enjoyed the music on this as well. Um, it's absolutely banging. Yeah, no, the, mu the music is really, really fantastic. Um, I mean... Like I say, there's no details on when this is going to be available for people to play just yet. But just musically, everything about it, like this to me looks like a full kind of like NES release or like a Switch release or something that you would get. I mean, for me, it was just the fact of how quickly it was running in that, you know, a lot of the moves are present. And it is, although it is the chibi cutesy version, it is so clearly Street Fighter 2. And I think the pixel art in it, you know, the people were behind this. This, this, this hasn't been rushed. This is like yeah. really, really fantastic looking. Yeah, some beautiful gradient graphics for the sky as well. There's going to be mm -hmm. tutorial training mode, three difficulty modes as well. Um, the special moves of combos are going to be in there. Ten backgrounds based on areas from Street Fighter 2, like the Battle Harbor, the Air Force Base, Big Factory as well. So, I mean, this does look like it's going to be a really full and complete game. And I think I'm just kicking myself that I didn't pick up a GX4000 like 10 years ago when they were oh, very cheap. Yeah, they were dirt cheap, weren't they, Dan? I remember we used to go to places and see them for like 40 quid sealed and stuff. It was uh, crazy. Yeah, there was a game shop near here in Lincoln. Um, Gotham Games, it was called. It's closed down there, sadly. And I remember seeing a box one in there for probably always about that price, 50 quid. And I remember eyeing it up. I don't know if you've ever had this when you're in a shop and like you literally are about to reach for it. Well, then, like, last minute, you think, oh, am I going to play it? That kind of little, you know, devil on my shoulders. Like, I think that's every retro show that I go to. I'm, like, yeah. reaching for stuff like, oh, yeah. do I need an Atari Lynx? <laughs> yeah, so that is what my, one of my retro regrets that I didn't pick it up. Because I think then, and a lot of us didn't really realise this kind of untapped power of the Amstrad CPC computers. You know, when I saw that Pinball Fantasies remake on there, like, six, seven years ago. That's kind of when yeah. I realised it's a bit more powerful than I assumed it was. Because back in the day, the Amstrad CPC, it seemed like most of it was basically straight spectrum ports, wasn't it? That really didn't tap into the power of the system. So, uh, yeah, this is if you've got an Amstrad uh, CPC 128K or a GX4000 gathering dust, this could be a good excuse to dig it out. We'll keep an eye on that. And if you want to check out the video so far, I'll link that in the show notes as well. Now, talking about videos, <laughs> this one made me laugh. It is one of our... Uh, our favourite YouTubers, this is James Channel, who um, you might remember he was the uh, the YouTuber who made that Nintendo PlayStation console by hand a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I love his videos because they're so kind of like, they're thrilling. You know, it's a bit of a roller coaster because he's just there with like saws and you know, circular swords and bus swords, just cutting up PlayStations and Nintendos like bare hand. And you just think he's going to cut his thumb off like any yeah. moment. Cause he's like, he's talking to the camera while he's doing it. And he's just like 
snapping bits of plastic by hand and you're just like, oh, but then it's always so amazing and like fantastic at the end and it's very watchable. Like you can't keep, keep take your eyes off yeah. it. You know, you're kind of like squirming. There's some YouTube channels where it's all clean and people 3D print stuff and they yeah. do it all very nicely. I, I like those, but I also kind of like the blokes that just bang things together. Yeah. And um, <laughs> this, this channel is very like that, but also that's like how I did a lot of modifications on my stuff when I was a kid. I've probably some stuff that I absolutely cringe at nowadays. <laughs> he basically, like you said, he, he snaps things apart by hand. Um, this new video is him basically turning, they're calling this the uh, NES Inception video. He turns a NES cartridge into a console. But watching this all the way through, most of this video is done using a circular saw that there are parts of this video where he slips a few times and gets very it's close to his It's an angle thumb. grinder, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that, that is not a thing that you normally would hold, you know, two centimetres from your thumb without any protection at all. Uh, James doesn't mind, though. Um, a lot of hot glue and a heat gun that he burns himself with <laughs> several times in the video as well. But the end result is probably better than something that I could do if I spent months doing it carefully. Because it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is incredible. Yeah, so- yeah. He's basically got a, a NES car and um, one of these AliExpress kind of consoles. Um, you know, one of these clone, clone consoles. Yeah, yeah, clone consoles. And then he's ripped the um, internals out of the cartridge and put the clone console inside. But it's not a case of just placing it in there. He's expanded the boards out. Um, you know, connected them up. It's it's quite interesting. Did, uh, have you played with any of these uh, clone consoles? I've I've never played. One, like I've been tempted to buy them in the past, um, you know, just kind of like for space saving and thinking, oh, do I sell my collection, etc. And I know they can be really hit or miss. Like sometimes you can get an absolute bargain and they work fantastic. And then other times, you know, they literally, you know, don't even have a stereo input on them <laughs> and like are absolute junk. So I'm not too sure if it's like a junk one that he's bought, but yeah. Well, he's not using expensive stuff. That's what mm. I like about it. You know, he's not using a rare prototype or, you know, a, like a... <laughs> uh, got an original prototype Famicom. Yeah. <laughs> His last apart. one was just kind of a, uh, a yeah. you know, cut-in old case that, that wasn't being used. And, yeah. and this is an old cartridge. So um, I kind of enjoy that you can just rip it to bits and just, you know, go mad with it because, yeah, monetary-wise, it's it's not worth that much. Yeah, I mean, it's worth watching the video. So basically, he uh, trims down this circuit board. It turns out, that, you know, both this clone console that he's bought and the original NES cartridges, there's actually quite a lot of room inside them. You know, the circuit boards are very small. Mm-hmm. So it turns out he's actually got room in there to keep the original game in the cartridge, but also put this clone console in the top part of it as well. And he, you know, sloppily cuts out some holes for controller ports and... Uh, video output and uh, even stuff like, you know, he uses USB for the power, um, which he kind of embeds, again, quite sloppily in the top of it, and then hooks it up, gets it working. He does make quite a few mistakes because of the way that he's done it. He's got a lot of traces and things don't work, as you'd expect, but he gets more working. And then I think the best bit of the video is, at the end, he actually takes this, basically, (laughs) this Frankenstein's monster of an NES console inside a cartridge, plugs it back in to an original NES, and the game is still playable as well. So that is why That's it is insane. NES Inception, yeah. they call it. So. And, and, and the final part is fixing the console with Bluetack, which, um, you know, it's a great technical one. And I like that it's not like a, a Nintendo World uh, Championship cart, but it's it would be kind gold. of f- <laughs> f- fun if he'd uh, sprayed it gold, <laughs> you know, just to wind people up, yeah. As much as I love like Adrian's digital basement and you know YouTubers like that, I think there is something you know. I love this kind of mad scientist approach that he's got in this channel. So if you want to check it out, I will I'll link that. James' channel is his name. Um, this is making a NES cartridge into a full console. I'll link that up, and of course, the rest of the stories in this week's show notes. Now we have got some more to talk about, including a uh, quite rare 3DO FPS game that is getting a remaster, and a brand new Mega Drive game that I'm sure will have Joe's appetite nicely whetted in just a moment. Before we do that, though, um, just a little reminder that 
the big reason that we can do this podcast each week is thanks to the wonderful community that we have around the show, and that is our incredible patrons. And we have got some rather exciting news, as uh, I can probably start replying to the uh, several hundred messages that I've had over the last 12 months going, I missed your Kickstarter, can I buy a book? Yeah, we've had quite a lot of them in the last couple of months, haven't we? But yeah, we are finally able to put our our uh, our overstock up for sale and we're going to be putting it out to the patrons to begin with, aren't we? For anybody who, who backs us on Patreon who missed it at the time. I mean, we do have new listeners coming in all the time. Kind of set up what this was, Enjo, for people that maybe weren't listening a year ago. Um, so about phew, two years ago, we had the crazy idea to make the podcast into a uh, tangible physical form. And uh, we actually picked uh, 10 of our favourite interviews that we've ever done and uh, 10 interviews that we think of maybe some of our most influential videos, well, influential from the uh, the guests uh, that we interviewed and uh, put it into a book, which we crowdfunded in December 2022. Um, and then we did an additional four interviews in there, exclusive interviews, which have never been on the show. And we put it into a book, which was over 400 pages long which was in people's hands in the, over the last couple of months. And we're really, really, really proud of it. And yeah, we've got about 100 left over, haven't we? Um, to, to kind of send out to people if they want to get their hands on it. Yeah, well, the good news is now that I think, you know, pretty much everyone that backed it on Kickstarter appears to have their copy now. So that yep. doesn't mean we have got, um, you know, some left because we did get a few more printed. And we've had a load of people asking, how do I get hold of one? So what we're going to do is right now, if you join us on Patreon or you're a member on Patreon, you'll have access to this as well. I'm going to put 50 up there just to start with this weekend. So if you'd like to get it, and we are actually going to sell these at the same price that they were on Kickstarter to our patrons mm-hmm. as well. So uh, if you want to get a hold of it, if you did miss out on that Kickstarter that we did, um, like you said, in December of 2022, and you've uh, wanted to get a hold of a Retro Hour book, maybe you've just started listening since then, a lot of people have been asking. So uh, get on there this weekend. You can uh, support us on Patreon. Of course, it helps out the podcast as well. And uh, get early access to uh, the Retro Hour book if you would like a copy on your shelf and as well. Also, on April the 7th, uh, Sunday, we're having our, our patrons hangout as well. So uh, don't forget that if you're a patron. Yeah, this coming Sunday, we didn't move it because uh, Joe was away last weekend and uh, everyone had plans with it being the Easter break. So we're going to be doing our uh, March hangout in uh, in April on uh, yeah. co- this <laughs> coming Sunday from 8pm UK time. If you haven't joined us for a hangout before, it's basically we all get together on a massive Zoom call and just geek out for a couple of hours about everything retro, show our pickups, get advice, bit of a virtual users group really. So a uh, very good time to join us on Patreon right now, support the podcast, get hold of a book and uh, join us for this weekend's hangout. All the details to join us on there are on the website at theretrohour.com. Now, you've always got your eye on new games for the Mega Drive, Joe. And uh, this always. one looks uh, this one looks pretty impressive so far. Yeah, so this is going to be uh, Cyber Mission, which is being developed by PSCD Games, um, who have actually made quite a few Mega Drive games recently, uh, including Black Jewel Reborn and Hunter Girls. Um, which were both actually crowdfunded campaigns, but they they unfortunately got cancelled, um, and they decided just to sell the games directly from their website, and you know, kind of like you know, make them as they're paid for, which I believe is what they're going to be doing with Cyber Mission as well. Now, this is interesting because of obviously a lot of these kind of modern retro games that come out and you know are released on you know Mega Drive, etc. They're usually kind of like based on qu- quite popular games. This is very akin to Forgotten Worlds. Are you guys familiar with that game? Yeah, I've got that on the Amiga. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I've played it. I've got it, um, but never see it as like, oh, that's a classic retro game. It's not one that um, I normally go to on my list of games when I uh, boot up my yeah. Android for month. Yeah, you don't tend to see it in the top ten Mega Drive or Amiga games or anything like that. I always thought it was a um, a Contra rip off but it's not it's actually more of a shoot 'em up you play as a it's a two player co-op game and you kind of play as like um like like on a jetpack aren't you and you 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 know you kind of fly across the moving screen and you can shoot forwards and backwards kind of bullet hell and this cyber mission is incredibly similar to that but obviously graphically um with the amount of enemies on the screen and stuff like that using kind of modern techniques the game is looking super smooth Super detailed, you know, kind of parallax scrolling in the background. Lots and lots of enemies on the screen. Very nice uh, pixel art. Yeah, or as always, you know, with these kind of modern 
Mega Drive games, but it does, it feels at the moment, you know, and I could be wrong, but we're talking about like a new Mega Drive game, Sega Genesis game, like every week at the moment. Like it is actually crazy how many. We could probably do two or three an episode. I yeah, two, two or three a week, you know, like it's, it's just crazy how many are actually coming out. And like, I feel sorry for completionists, <laughs> you know, who include these releases in like, you know, the lineup of like wanting to like get every single game. Do they um, count them though? Because I know your friend Jason is a Mega Drive completionist. Does he count like the new releases and homebrew stuff? Uh, he he doesn't because right. of I think more just from like a cost point of view. Because what you find is often these games will come out, you know, for forty quid, forty dollars, fifty quid kind of thing, um, and they quickly, especially if they're popular, become incredibly expensive. Such as um, yeah. Paprium, you know, which is uh, on the older side. Oh now, yeah, but, and that's on like a special cart as well. Yeah, yeah, but. That can that can command like three hundred quid now on eBay, like you know I see people trying to sell a special edition of that for hundreds of hundreds. So I think just from a cost point of view, some collectors just kind of you know they'll buy it if they want it if it looks good kind of thing, um you know back it when it's you know when it first comes out kind of thing. Um, personally, I don't I I don't see it as like this is part of the original lineup, but I think for me it's once again it comes to that where do you stop. <laughs> kind of and cost factor not that I'm trying to get a full Mega Drive collection because I just think the amount of money that it costs now is just insane but it's good to see fans of Sega still making Sega games in 2024 you know the Sega died what in 95 96 the Mega Drive so we're coming up to 30 years ago it never died Joe it never died it still lives on but it's just amazing to see the capabilities of you know what people are pushing the yeah. console to do on original hardware now and then i know there's games like paprium as you say ravi that've got special carts and stuff like that uh you know that can do so much more but so many of these games that are coming out don't have those special carts and are just original this is original hardware and original cart and look how amazing it looks and yeah you know cyber mission is going to be another one of those games yeah, and I'm not sure whether it's going to physical release or not. I mean, it might just be a ROM download, but it looks like it's only a alpha it version like, at the moment. It looks like it's going to get a physical release um, right. because of uh, PSCD games do do the physical releases of these games. You, know, you just buy oh, them okay. directly from them for $45 um, with cartridge and um, cartridge and case. They usually do them with. Um, so I believe this will get a physical release as well. It looks like they are doing a Kickstarter for this one. Oh, okay, that's yeah, brilliant. That's so good there you to go. See. It looks like that should be a yeah, full release and fingers crossed. So uh, yeah, it looks like they're setting that up at the moment. So if you want to keep an eye on that, I will link up their website and uh, the video as well so you can check those out. Now, uh, Night Dive Studios have obviously done some uh, very high-profile remasters and updates of classic games for modern consoles in recent years. We've got the uh, Quake 1 and 2 special editions, and I love those on the Switch. Uh, Turok, we're talking about Turok 3 they did recently. Um, mm-hmm. Star Wars Dark Forces as well. Must admit, this uh, this latest title from them is a little bit left of centre. Have you heard of Poed before? I've heard of it, never played it, never really watched gameplay of it until now. Am I right in thinking it was a was it a 3DO, 3DO game in the mid-90s? Yeah, well, this was a FPS game that came out in 1995, um, right. developed by a company called Any Channel Inc. Uh, for the 3DO interactive multiplayer. Uh, the idea is that you are a, uh, a chef who is attempting to escape a hostile alien world. Um, and right. then a year later, they did a version for the PlayStation 1. Um, okay. But now it turns out, I mean, I must admit, if I'm thinking of... 3DO FPS games. Killing Time is generally the one that most people think of. I think, you know, these early FPS struggled a lot. So um, here's a review from um, Maximum uh, back in the days about Poed saying it's the worst 3D action title ever <laughs> seen on any format. <laughs> <laughs> with the exception of <laughs> Crime Cackers on the PlayStation or early PC public domain games. Indeed, the graphics and glade play uh, uh very reminiscent of past atrocities. Um, to be fair, I could show them a few Amiga <laughs> FPS games that might change their mind. Yeah, I think, you know, it It looks like an interesting, fun title, but it may not have ran as well back then. Hmm. But, you know, jazzing it up for the modern age has probably, uh, uh, you know, turned it into an actual 
playable game. I found that a lot with, um, you know, um, some of the FPSs on on the Amiga. Um, when I use an accelerator, um, I can actually play them and think, oh, this is quite decent and put it into a better kind of, uh, you know, speed and, and make it more playable. Whereas before, you know, um, it was a glitchy mess, <laughs> as they say. But, you know, some other people thought it was all right. Was a, there was some 79% uh, ratings in uh, uh, 3DO magazines and stuff. I mean, 95, that was, you know, right in the the heart of kind of the FPS craze, wasn't it? You know, kind of, you know, between Doom and Quake, I suppose, around that time. And the 3DO was, again, you know, another almost ran system. They came out at a very weird era between the Super Nintendo and the Mega Drive and, you know, the PlayStation. So it was a strange time in the industry, I think. Um, but the concept of the game I do like, the fact that you played this kind of crazy chef and your, your weapons include a frying pan to smack aliens over the head with. Um, and a jetpack as well. You know what it stands for? What, Poed? Yeah. Pissed off. Right. Nice. (laughs) It might be peed off then, I guess. I don't know. I've I've always pronounced it Poed. But yeah, it's. uh, I think, you know, it it is a very unusual title to do an update of. And uh, again, I think probably most people have forgotten. Uh, But you're right, Night Dive Studio are going to be doing a full updated version of uh, Poed called the Definitive Edition, coming to PC and consoles, including uh, updated visuals, increased frame rate, up to 4K graphics as well, uh, fixing up the controls, which is often one thing if you go back and you try and play these early FPS games on original hardware. That's the one thing that generally throws me off quite a bit. Um, so I was playing some uh, FPS games on the the N64, um, Perfect Dark. I was playing on that actually, and that you know just feels weird playing it with mm. just one analog stick. On it's, it's, got yeah. it's, it's got the elements of it's it's got the elements of those early FPSs that I really enjoy, like the the kind of uh, short rooms with tall high ceilings and uh, you know spaces like that, but also you know kind of garish textures. The textures remind me of Quake quite a bit, actually. The first Quake. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does look like Quake, but um, you know, obviously in the 4K version, it's uh, it's all been cleaned up a bit and stuff. And uh, yeah, it, it looks interesting. It looks absolutely mental as well. Like to me, nothing in this kind of balances. <laughs> like you know, um, but that can make it fun, and it, it feels very nostalgic at the time. Um, yeah, it does kind of look a bit pd as well to me uh public domain but but yeah i i love that stuff <laughs> you know so i can see how nostalgically this is a a really cool one uh for them to release and i'm surprised that they've kind of gone for this um but yeah it, it must be a a kind of uh a huge decision I... let's take this one back or maybe there was a like uh poed fan um you know on the team i just uh i want them to do blood did you guys ever play that? The oh, mid nineties yes, FPS. Yeah. Blood's that's, a classic, yeah. I don't think that's ever come to console. And I just think Redneck like, Rampage, that's what Yeah, they, need to they do. just I think Night Dive need to do them. Like this is cool. I'm sure there's probably a lot of fans for, you know, Poed. Um Probably not. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but yeah, it just does seem like a straight one a, a strange one. You know, they've done so many popular games before. Maybe it was just they could get the IP. Who knows? But they've definitely, from the trailer, they've definitely cleaned it up and modernised it. So maybe it is a lot more playable now. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, if they they think this is worth restoring, it's making me more interested in it. Like I said, I'm familiar yeah. with it on the 3DO. I don't think I've ever played it. Maybe I, I burnt like a CD of it once for the 3DO yeah. and played it for like five minutes. Um, but the fact that, you know, like I said, they've done such big games like Quake and Turok and stuff like that. The fact that Night Dive are thinking, well, this is worth doing. Is making me yeah, maybe yeah. want to have a second look at this game or a proper look at it. So there you go. If you want to try out maybe an FPS game that you weren't familiar with before, um, the Definitive Edition is going to be coming to our Windows via Steam and GOG, uh, PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox and Nintendo Switch, apparently in the very near future. So if you want to check that out and the uh, trailer so far, I'll link that up. And of course, the rest of the stories, you don't have to Google around. I save you the job every week. I put them in the show notes on your podcast app, or you can head to our website and click through from theretrohour.com. 
Right, patrons, stay tuned. We have got a couple of extra news stories just for our wonderful patrons, because we do that every week on the podcast. We chop all the adverts out for the patrons, so we give you like an extra 10, 15 minutes of news. That is coming up in a second. Everybody else, get ready for our interview with the amazing Ken Levine talking about Bioshock and lots more. Before that, though, let's just take a second to give a massive thank you to this week's sponsor, and is one of our longest-running sponsors, our wonderful mates at ExpressVPN. And the reason we love ExpressVPN is not only, you know, the privacy aspects of VPNs, keeping us secure as well and looking after our data, but we love the fact that you can actually get access to more from your streaming services. Because we've talked about this before, the fact that Netflix, you know, amazingly, they've got more than 18,000 titles available on Netflix worldwide. But if you live in like the US, for example, you only actually get access to 6,000 of those. And you know the prices that services like Netflix, they're increasing all the time. So really it means not only you're not getting value for money, but you're missing out on literally thousands of great shows as well, unless you use ExpressVPN. Now, how does this work, Ravi? Yeah, well, ExpressVPN, you can uh, install the app, you can have it on your phone, you can have it on your laptop, on your tablet, TV, or even have it on your router. And basically, you just change location straight away. Whilst you're watching Netflix, refresh refresh it, and then you're able to see the libraries from uh, the location that you've chose throughout the world. And the thing is, it's really good as well, because it's really fast. There's no buffering going on there and uh that's great because you can access a lot of shows that are not available on other netflix so one i've been watching on the u.s netflix is i've got the hookup which is a one that i mentioned before a fantastic film master p um kind of a crime comedy rap film about um mobile phones being hacked in the 90s which is just like ultimately cool of course a uh, team america Oh, yeah. Total underrated film. And uh, Rain Man as well, which I've been watching on uh, USA Netflix. And I can't get them in the UK, so it's just great that I can do that. Yeah, no, ExpressVPN lets you change your online location to more than over 100 different locations around the world. So that means you unlock so much more, thousands of new shows. And uh, not only Netflix, it works with Disney+, Plus, Hulu, Max, BBC iPlayer, that normally is UK only. So um, that's the thing, ExpressVPN pays for itself. And it works on all these different devices, you know, your phone, your laptop, tablet, TV, you name it. It just works on there as well. Really fast, no buffering. And it is a VPN service that we choose. So if you'd like to try out ExpressVPN for yourself, then why don't you use our exclusive link? And of course, you'll be helping out the podcast by supporting our sponsors. And also, we'll give you a nice little discount as well. You'll get three months extra free on a one-year plan. So use our exclusive link so they know that we sent you expressvpn.com slash retro. That is expressvpn.com slash retro to get three months on a one-year plan completely free. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And a massive thank you to our friends at ExpressVPN for their continued support of the show. Well, well, thank you for checking out the news this week. A little reminder as well that if you do enjoy the podcast, uh, we appreciate not everybody can support us on Patreon, we get that, but if there is, you know, if you would like to help us out, there's one little thing that you could do, if you can uh, leave us a little nice rating and review on your podcast client of choice, uh, we did get a few nice ones on Apple Podcasts, didn't we, over the last couple of weeks, um, so we're always keeping an eye on those, and uh, Ravi generally is the first to spot them and screenshot them and send them over, so it is uh, not only very heartwarming to see, you know, it means a lot to us, but also really helps out the podcast as well, because nice reviews on, you know, places like Spotify and Apple Podcast get us up the algorithms you know it's good for that gets in the podcast charts gets us in front of new people as well so it all helps out so if you uh, would like to do something to help out the show that is really appreciated and uh, next keep it here we have got this week's very special guest going inside the world of games like Thief System Shock 2 and of course the legendary Bioshock with our guest Ken Levine he's next on the Retro Hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And today, someone who's a true visionary in the video games industry, and I worked on some incredible games. I mean, listing off some of these titles: Thief, System Shock 2, Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite, and uh, the incredible new game as well that we're looking forward to called Judas. I'm sure we'll get into, and uh, lots of history as well with our guest this week, Ken Levine. How's it going, Ken? Great to see you guys. Um, I'm very looking forward to talking about the old games that helped form me. 
Yeah, well, that's uh, that's our favourite subject, talking about old games. So uh, you're in good company here. Now, um, one thing that we always like to find out from our guests is kind of a bit of background on where your interest in gaming and computers began. I mean, do you remember your your first video game experience, where it all started for you? Yeah, I mean, my first game experiences were um, electromechanical machines. I think, mm. you know, we were talking about a minute ago, which is before there were video games, there were these, you know, yeah, the most basic version of is pinball, right? But there was a lot of games, like there were base, um, you know, baseball games that used like a silver ball, you know, actually like a pinball and a mechanical bat. And there was like the backboard, sorry, the field was like painted with like baseball players in it. And you could, you you know, if you hit the third baseman, sometimes you use even like a metal miniature or something, you know, you would be out. And I'm sure it was just like, it had a sensor if the ball hit it, you know, and the ball would drain. There was things like, um, you could actually see it there's like the shark attack game. I can't remember what it's called, but you actually see it in the movie Jaws. They're playing it in the arcade that used basically a bunch of frames, of pre-painted frames, and lights would go on and off behind them. And it would you had a little like gun you were shooting at at it, but and I'm sure it just had a very simple like IR, you know, hit detection of some kind. But man, when I saw that game the first time, that was like animated 3D art. You know, it was amazing. And then so there are a lot of early electrum, and then there was games going back to the turn of the century. I used to go to this place at this mall near me in New Jersey, where I grew up, where they had these like turn of the century electromechanical machines that were really interesting and had a great aesthetic. And, you know, they used to run on a penny or a dime or something like that. And then, of course, you know, when the actual video games came in, like Pong, I still remember Pong coming in and, and Pac-Man and Space Invaders, you know, it's kind of hard to describe mm. as a kid, I think because... I didn't really have a lot of friends and getting like, you know, having games you could play by yourself, you know, because otherwise I'd be like in my basement playing Monopoly by myself. Or if, you know, I got into even these like complicated, my brother turned me on to these complicated like hex based board games, like Squad Leader or something, but I play them against myself. Right. So having an opponent, you know, to play against, you know, when you're playing, you know, a direct opponent. In multiplayer games, but didn't have a lot of friends, but didn't like, you know, be able to play. You don't need a friend to play Pac-Man. You don't need a friend to play Space Invaders. And having that activity that I can do like uncompromised, you know, because you couldn't do a game, a board game without people, but you could do a video game with people. And that was just, and that solved a lot of my problems as a kid. That kind of mix between f physical and playing a game is really interesting. Like, um, I think it was Cubert where they had a, a pinball knocker in the actual arcade machine as well. And um, you get some of those modern, um, you know, pinball machines with like video screens and kind of game stuff. And I think that theme's gone into a few of your your games in the in the future. But um, I was I was wondering what was your first kind of home computer then when when you got one to play games by yourself? I So I got my Atari in the eighth grade, my Atari 2600. And then of all the computers, my mom bought a there was a thing called a Coleco Atom, which was like like a, a spruced up Coleco Vision. If you guys know that console, yeah, um, it was. I don't think I don't I don't know if it came out there, but um, it came out in the states, and it had a very rudimentary like it had this like fast tape drive, basically cassette like a, like a custom cassette drive that was faster than you used to load video games. Like first you were loading, you know, when you got home computers, you used to you used to have to like type in everything. But then they had tape, you know, literal cassette tapes would be the storage device and then uh, floppy disks. But this was sort of, it sort of had the storage device that was like a fast access cassette tape, but it was still really slow. And it came with one game called Buck Rogers and the Planet of Zoom or something. But my, because it was a computer, my mom wouldn't let me play the game on it. So I could only play games on my Atari. And I just had a little black and white television to play my Atari on uh, because my mom thought it would like hurt the, it would break the, color tv for some reason right. <laughs> um so it, i had a pretty limited access to a lot of things and you know but i would have my birthday at the arc you know at the arcade and you know and i'm sure you guys remember the arcade used to be where the innovation happened yeah you know there were so many new ideas in the early era of our, because nobody knew what the thing was right you know now when you go to the arcade it's all basically it's a few gun games there's a bunch of basically pinball machines and a bunch of gambling games effectively but then it was like oh my god What's this? What is this game? Uh, and it has like, you know, like dragons there. It's got like a laser disc and you've got, you know, um, even like Hubert, you know, these weird innovations of like having a, a you know, a, a mechanical knocking device in the thing. 
hybrids, like there was a Pac-Man game, there was a hybrid pinball machine and a Pac-Man game. Um, there was all these real innovation that was happening there, both technologically, because back then the home versions weren't nearly as good as the arcade versions, but now the arcades, the machines running in arcades are not particularly powerful. Like you're, no, they're they not look like mobile games in arcades yeah, now all yeah. the time. Yeah. And they kind of are. It's kind of depressing. Yeah. The arcade is a pretty depressing place now, I think. Yeah. Because it's not the market just doesn't incentivize you know innovation, um, mm. but so the innovation now is happening you know primarily like in the indie space you know in, in, in computer games mostly right now. Well, I'm looking at the Coleco Adam, and yeah, it looks a really unique machine. Actually, it looks a bit like a a music center with the the tape unit there in the front. It looks like a hi-fi server or something. Um, yeah, yeah, because yeah, like a hi-fi. But yeah, that was it. That was a storage device, like a mm. weird custom storage solution that they had. They didn't work very well. I well, said, you know, today that'd be equivalent of two thousand two hundred and twenty dollars um, if you were to buy one today. So you know, the fact that your, your mother invested in that machine back then. I mean, what, what were you doing with it then? Did you did you try your hand at programming at that time? What, what were you kind of doing on the Adam? So I did, you know, word processing for my school for school, um, and I I tried to program. Like we actually had these computers called Pets, um, Commodore like, ones, Commodore Pets yeah. in the in, in school, and they were basically a green screen, monochrome screen with no real graphics capability. You could do remap character sets, which I'm sure you guys remember those where yeah. you could sort of make a rudimentary graphics out of different, you know, they replaced the font, the basic font with some very simple block shapes that you could combine in some really like rudimentary way to make visuals. But we'd go in every day and they used to have books like programming games in basic and it would have like a list of programs and you literally go in the morning and you type that stuff in and you, if you were lucky before homeroom started, you could get the whole game in and play it once, but then they didn't have any tape drives. So you basically turned the computer off <laughs> and you got to like, pro, you got to retype in for like an hour, half an hour, and then you play for like five minutes and then you'd have to do it all again the next day. Um, but people, the friends I had then, I made a lot of friends around computing. You know, that was super exciting at the time. Yeah, those, those were amazing little devices. Yeah, well, you were also a fan of a uh, civilization as well, which I think is a a series that's kind of stood the test of time. It's still going going today. Um, what drew you to that series then, and why did it stand out? Um, yeah, I mean, Civilization. I think I first played it. I remember playing it on a a, bo- a friend's borrowed PC because I didn't have a computer. I had a Macintosh um, back then, but there were like no games for the Macintosh because I was a graphic designer, so I needed to have a Macintosh. But I wanted a PC, but I couldn't afford it. So a friend loaned me a PC for like a week and I got Civilization, XCOM and um, Ultima Underworld to play on it, oh, I remember. Right. And um, Civilization was just one of those games that you couldn't even imagine it was possible because it was so much more sophisticated than anything like it. And it was pretty complex, like figuring, especially with the rudimentary graphics, like figuring out you know, the balance between, they still have all the same things, like the balance between, you know, luxury items and, 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 you know, the, the guns and butter decisions. Do I build more weapons? Do I build? And it had all that stuff in the first one. And I played it endlessly. And it was like a full war game at a full, like, you know, building game. And it was incredible. So I think that game really stood out at its time as, an as what strategy games could become. And then XCOM mm-hmm. came out shortly after that. Micropose is just really, doing incredible things in the strategy space. And those games, I mean, you can go back and play. I'm sure if somebody could remaster the original Civilization, it would play okay. The interface would probably be really obtuse, but um, the basics haven't really changed on Civilization in what's been, let's see, 1991, 30 some odd years. It's still basically the same game. Mm. And and not in a bad way, in a great way, because, you know, it's a formula that will, as you say, stand the test of time. You mentioned Ultima Underworld there as well, and you know, was was the idea of that game? I mean, obviously, it tied in the narrative aspect of it as well, and was a really immersive game as well. Was that kind of one element that that stood out to you playing Ultima Underworld? Yeah, I think if Ultima Underworld was the genesis of that, sparked in me the potential of emerging gameplay. Like I remember still, and it was at the time there was nothing like it. There was no all the dungeon games back then were like wizardry, where you'd move a you weren't really moving in a 3D space. You were moving on a grid and you would move an entire grid square at a time and nothing really happened in the physical environment. It was just a very crude mapping of basically a mini game of combat you'd get into when you got into a square with an enemy in it. 
And it was this turn-based thing where Ultima Underworld was so innovative. A, you know, it's the first game with really a, an immersive 3D rendered, fully 3D environment because Doom is, you know, Doom and Duke Duke were really two and a half D. Mm. They weren't really 3D. They were the, the, you couldn't have a space over a space in those games. Where in Underworld, I remember, and, you know, and, and the early and the earlier Dungeon Crawl games were every counter encounter stood on its own. You would never like merge encounters or have any emergent stuff come out of it. So I remember I was playing Ultima Underworld and um, I was like ran into some orcs or something or goblins and I was being chased by them. And then I turn a corner while me chasing these orcs and I ran into this spider, like this giant spider. And that combination of those two things, I still remember the moment of those two things combining, which was like, boo, what's this? What's this? I'm like, and I didn't know the word, but the word was emergence, right? That experience happened to me. It wasn't a designer plan that. It was, I made it happen. You could find fish and you could eat it for a certain number of hit points, but you could also put it in the fire and that would cook it. And then you get more hit points back. So all these little tiny emergence systems that, you know, obviously, you know, we're doing Bioshock, making sure things could light on fire properly. And as you'd expect, you know, that the world behaves in a way that you'd expect it to, because once that happens, you can do a lot more with the game because you don't really have to train that putting food in fire cooks it, right? Yeah. You know, you allow for that and then let the player find it. And the more the world starts behaving as we expect it to, the more the player can then engage in strategizing and thinking of ways they can, you know, leverage the world. So that game was probably that game led to my career, you know, in terms of me understanding what I wanted to do as a game designer. So that game was probably the most influential game on me in my career. But was the pacing a huge part of it as well? Because, you know, as you said, playing like dungeon crawlers before, you'd be clicking through sections and suddenly you'd be chucked into it in Ultima Underworld and you'd have to be really like reactionary and looking at stuff like Bioshock, you know, you're, you're chucked into a situation and you've kind of got to react with that speed. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it allows for events to happen that the designers didn't intend where the grid-based structure, basically you were just, you could choose how what path you move through the dungeon, sort of, but eventually you were going to bump into the squares where the planned encounters were. And then it was really just like a die rolling game at that point. And I, listen, I played infinite amounts of Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord, you know, the first Wizardry game infinite amounts, both on the Apple II and then later on my Mac as it came out. But it, it was great. It just wasn't, you know, that it didn't realize that emergent concept where I, I, I do think Underworld was probably one of the first games to do that in a way that feels akin to what I'm working on, what, I'm, what I spend the rest of my career doing. Well, let's talk about your move into the industry then. So how did you find out about the job at Looking Glass? Um, there is a magazine called Next Gen, which I think was the American version of Edge. Yeah. And this was in the, you know, I was in, I had moved to, I would moved out to LA to be a screenwriter and sort of had a, a bit of a flash in the pan career of that. I got one job and then I never got another. And I spent the next few years sort of um, very depressed actually, because, you know, I thought I was going to have a creative career because I was like this little you know, when I was a teenager, I was like entering all these writing contests and winning writing contests. And everybody's like, oh, kid, you're going to go far. And then I became a screenwriter, which is sort of seemed the natural fulfillment of my path. I, and it didn't, I didn't make it. And um, so I basically spent a bunch of years in the wilderness, like just doing, I was a computer consultant. I was a graphic designer and I wasn't particularly passionate about any of it. You know, I was watching the clock like, you know, most people do in their jobs. And then I moved. I decided like, you know, I want to be creative. Maybe it's a different field I could be creative in. And I, I had been playing games my whole life, as I said. Like it was, it was like the thing I immediately connected to. It wasn't like something I enjoyed. It was something I obsessed over. And then I was like, I was reading Next Gen and I liked it because it felt like um, inside the industry, sort of like Edge does a little bit. And I saw an ad for it. Um, a job at Looking Glass as a uh, designer. And I, I think I had applied to Westwood Studios before for, but, you know, I, and I didn't get it. I didn't, I had an interview, but I didn't get the job. And then I applied for the job at Looking Glass, which was like, oh, well, and I love that company because like they were working on Terra Nova at that point. Um, and they had done System Shock, which was the first System Shock, which was 
the next step in immersion, you know, up from Ultima Underworld. I was blown away by that game. And um, I saw the jo- job for a game ad for a game designer. I'm like, like what's a game designer? Like, I, I never really connected that people like built the experience. You know, I didn't really understand how it happened. I guess um, it was a relatively recent thing at that stage. Yeah, I, it, yeah. it was game designers were a bit of a redheaded stepchild back then because, you know, programmers ruled the roost there. And, but it wasn't, and, and rightfully so, because they were, a lot of them were game designers and programmers, right? The guys who did Underworld were basically all programmers and who were also game designed. And, you know, they brought an incredible amount of innovation and brilliance that, you know, without them, without, without those games, Ultima Underworld and System Shock 1, I'm not, you know, there's no Ken Levine career. You know, those really showed me the possibility. And I think that I sought out for a game designer and I, and I applied. And I think because I'd been in Hollywood and this was a time, like Terra Nova had all these um, full motion video cutscenes in them with act, like, act, like no offense to anybody who works on Terra Nova. I love the game, but you know, the writing and the acting was not exactly top tier, but they saw me as a Hollywood guy and they thought maybe I knew something about how to make their, you know, narrative a little stronger in those departments. And they brought me in and I applied and I like, it was like going to a game company. It was like, there's this great Simpsons episode where Bart goes into the Mad Magazine offices and first he's disappointed because he thinks it's just a boring office. And then like the door opens and like Alfred E. Newman and all these crazy characters are behind the door. <laughs> and, and and it's sort of like you go into the office. It was a boring office in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts by the train station. Very boring office park. But when you went in there, man, you just felt a certain magic happen. And, you know, I was walking around and people are playing games during the day, you know, on their computers and they're arguing about games and they're talking about games. And, and I was like, oh my God, like, this is a job. And so I got the job somehow and, you know, I, and I took about half, I took about a salary cut, about a half what I was making as a computer consultant in New York. You know, they offered me a partnership to stay in the computer consulting firm. And I said, and these guys were really nice guys I was working for, but I said, there guys, there's literally nothing you can offer me that would make me stay. I really appreciate it, but this is like a dream for me. And yeah. I went there and, um, yeah, I was, I, I'll never forget my first, you know, year at Looking Glass. It was an incredible experience. You started on a, a Star Trek Voyager game, which is interesting that you talk about Terra Nova as well, because that time there were a lot of like sci-fi titles in the kind of video game world. Um, that got canceled as well. What happened with that one? So that was like a Sierra style adventure using the Star Trek Voyager characters. Okay. And um, so like a Sierra adventure, you like walk around and I was working on that, which is weird because I don't really, um, I don't really like those. Like I enjoyed King's Fist at the time because it was um, graphical and cool, but the sort of like there's one solution thing, you know, to me has never been super fun. I never really liked Zork games or anything for the same reason, which makes me weird for an old timer. Most people just Zork is a huge touchstone for them. But for me, I really like the games that had emergence, you know, like Castle Wolfenstein, the original, you know, I don't know if your audience know about the original Castle Wolfenstein and the Apple II before. Yeah. Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> that game was another massive inspiration. But yeah, so I, I was working on a game. I was, I was working on, I was splitting my time between the thing that became Thief and, and the, and the um, Voyager game. And the half of my day I worked on Thief was by far the better half. Um, like I was writing for the Voyager game and, like, I love the original Star Trek, but I was, and I liked Voyager, but I wasn't, you know, it it wasn't really, um, it really wasn't really my thing because it was not emergent in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't really a good game for Looking Glass to be working on because I think they were trying to put emergence into it. Like, I remember there was a moment where I was talking to a programmer, a friend of mine on the project. He was writing a physics system for the Voyager game. And I said, you know, why do we have a physics system in this game? It's a Sierra Adventure game. There's no simulation element. And he was like, that's... And this is one of the smartest guys I ever met. He was just assigned this, um, this John Che, my, my co-founder, um, of Rational. Yes, before he became my co-founder. Um, and he's like, yeah, I'm not really sure why there's a physics system. And I think it was just sort of a natural looking glass thing to do to put some element of simulation, in, even though the game really didn't need it or leverage it in any meaningful way. So it was sort of a doom project. It was not at the right company. And I don't think I was the right guy necessarily to be writing it, but I, you know, I wrote a bunch of stuff and I did my best, but it was probably, but compared to working on the thief stuff and all the games before thief became thief, um, I, I think I was way more interested in that because that was really the looking glass sort of, you know, 
open-ended simulation emergent gameplay. Yeah, I, I wondered about how like open-ended the brief was then. Was it just like create an RPG? <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was literally Paul Narath, the president, would do the team presentations and he'd, he'd plot out a timeline of future projects and they would have very rough names like military flight sim became, you know, was an expansion on the flight game they had. Um, and then there was RPG and action RPG. And I got assigned to these sort of action RPG with Doug Church, who was, you know, like the, was sort of the guy behind a lot of underworld and, and system shock. And, um, you know, and it was, it was many different projects before it became thief. I, I like we kissed a lot of frogs that came up with like seven or eight different concepts, like, you know, five, 10 page documents of concepts that Doug would read. We talk about it. Then eventually he'd say, ah, eh, I don't know about this one. And, you know, I learned very quickly there that to not get too attached to my ideas. Um, but I do think thief was the best of them. And I think we, we, it was the right thing to cancel all those ideas. And Doug taught me a lesson about throwing things away. And how important that is to find something better. I mean, you could do that to an extreme, but I think that's a really valuable lesson. How big a job was it to create the the dark engine internally? Yeah, so I didn't. I used it extensively, but I can't. I claim zero credit for creating anything in it. That was, you know, a bunch of really smart engineers there. Mm. Uh, they had they built their own engine. It was a constructive solid geometry engine. Um, subtractive rather than additive those words mean anything to you you know basically the world starts as a giant block of stone and you make air pockets in it basically to make your dungeon to make your thief levels and then you'd you'd have solid brushes that you would sort of make pillars in out of that but you were basically carving out of a giant piece of rock effectively and it was a very interesting engine for its time because it had a lot of amazing capabilities like like the AI, how the AIs worked and how they heated up and cooled down. A lot of that came out of like the conversations that Doug and I have been having about what we wanted to see out of AI in the game. So through all the iterations of, of the game before it became Thief, it was like called Better Red Than Undead for a while. It was called Split Knuckle. It was called Dark Elves Must Die. Split Knuckle was like a Kung Fu game. There was School of, of Mages or School of Wizards, which was like a magic using game. And eventually, but they all had this idea that the enemies would not just see you and attack you, that they would get suspicious that there was somebody there. I mean, Jug and I was like, is there somebody there? That became the word we phrase we kept repeating. And that I think was the genesis of the sort of thief game in the sense that it was a game about not being detected. And that's why the thief idea was the strongest because it really leaned into that very clever AI idea we have, but, all, but more importantly, the, the very clever implementation of it by the team um, of that AI system. And then, you know, um, people coming up with like, you know, the whole darkness crystal based upon the intensity of light map under your feet. You know, so we we're, there was a very innovative game and I really enjoyed, it was great. It was, I enjoyed working on that game a lot. I still remember it very fond. It was the first game I ever worked on that shipped. Well, how important was it to be ahead with an engine back then? I mean, was that a bit of an arms race? It was, but we were pretty, I mean, it depends on what the, what you're looking for. Like in terms of rendering speed and everything, it was pretty far behind. It was slow. One challenge it had is it created, in order for to instantiate an object, it was extremely expensive, you know, at runtime to instantiate objects. So I remember we were trying to make, later on when we do went to do System Shock 2 and, you know, me being the game designer, I'm like, you got a pistol and you got a shotgun, you got a machine gun. The machine gun was a real problem because the game could not create the bullets objects fast enough to make a believable machine gun because it just, that was a real expensive proposition because it had a fairly complex uh, object database items it had an item system that allowed things like system shock 2 to exist at the time you know first person game with sort of rpg level you know object depth but it also made the game very very slow so we you know when we did system shock 2 we just deliberately decided to make it a slower paced game because we knew the engine couldn't keep up with you know quake and unreal and things like that in terms of speed and that that was kind of when you set up irrational games as well and um, it's a really interesting name. And was the idea to kind of, you know, give you a bit more freedom and uh, uh, kind of, you know, ex be able to experiment more with ideas? Yeah, like I never, I've never been very good with bosses, you know? So like I was at Looking Glass for a year and a half and 
I kind of like, oh, I, I wish I could just run this thing because it would run, it would run better and the game would go faster and blah, 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 which is probably really naive of me, right? I was, I was, you know, you always think you're, you know, when you get in the industry that you're, you got a new way of doing things. Now, of course, I think that's also a benefit because when we did System Shock 2, like only one of us had ever shipped a game with the three partners before. Like John and I hadn't. Only Rob Fermi had, had shipped a game. And um, so some, the value of not knowing what you're doing combined with some real dumb luck made, you know, System Shock 2 work, I think. Um, those guys knew way more than we were doing than I did. Like, I was really inexperienced and um, that game couldn't have been made without those two guys, you know, with their, they're both programmers and, and, you know, John was an excellent product manager, product manager. But I think I was empowered by what I didn't know at the time that, you know, you could make this big game with these, you know, horror game with, you know, this engine and, you know, um, all the, all the, all the aspects that made the game unique. I think I was just designing what I thought would be cool. And as you get to learn more, you start to dismiss certain things because you know they're hard to do or whatever, or people don't like them. Then sometimes you're, you make assumptions probably that aren't true. So it's challenging to be stay innovative as you get, as you, your career gets longer because you sort of wear into certain patterns where I started. I had no patterns, you know, to, to obey. I was making the patterns in real time for myself. And I guess that enabled you to take more risk as well and just go with an idea that you, you were really confident with. Yeah, there were times like I remember like one day I came to John and I was like, um, hey, I really think this or I had spec'd out a level. Like I, had, I did the documents for each of the levels and what, you know, the, the medical level and the engineering level but, uh, or what, you know, the story would happen there. And there was a level I wanted on the surface of the ship that would have zero G, you know, action and or low gravity action. And John was like, dude, we have 14 months to make this game. Like, what are you even thinking? And I wasn't thinking is the thing. Like I, I was not thinking, I didn't understand how expensive that would be or how complicated that would be at the time and how much work. A wo- and I didn't understand the concept of doing work, a ton of work for a short period of, of the game, you know, one-off work was n- when you have limited resources was not a good idea. So there are, are things that definitely I I stumbled into that weren't a good idea, but my, my partners helped me through that. And I think we ended up making, you know, we, we, we narrowed down to the things we could do and, um, you know, and certainly the story elements, the engine was pretty good at, you know, at the time for supporting some of the story elements So you know, I built a lot of those cutscenes, and they were, they were, you know, there wasn't a great tool set, you know, to make those. So they were pretty hacked together, but, um, you know, we made it work. You mentioned about the levels there and, you know, the level design and the audio in particular as well on System Shock 2 was very immersive. I mean, was that kind of bringing more atmosphere into the game, something that you really wanted to establish as kind of a, something that you'll bring to your titles or something you'll, you'll be known for? Yeah, I remember like, um, so System Shock 1 came out on floppy disks originally. This is when I was, before I was in the games industry. And I played it briefly. I played the demo for the PC Gamer dem- magazine. It used to come like a floppy disk with a demo on it. And I wasn't very impressed. And then the CD-ROM version came out that added the, au- the audio logs were just text originally. And then they added the recordings to the audio logs, which are so atmospheric. That, and that was Eric Brosius, you know, did that. And Greg LaPiccolo at, at Looking Last. And, um, you know, they did the sound treatment. And Eric's, you know, and, the, and, and, and Greg's sound treatment was so sophisticated and so moody that I immediately is like recognized it as a major tool to creating tension and drama. And so like poor Eric was just like never, I would never leave him alone. I would just bother him constantly. And he would just, you know, make really impossible things happen. Um, like, I don't even know. If you go look at the tools that they have, how they designed the original Shodan voice, you know, it's extremely complicated. Like all the, you know, the, all the breakups of voice, you know, all, the, uh, you know, all her weird vocal tics, all those were handmade. And, you know, I can't even imagine how rudimentary the tools were back then relative to what they have now. But I don't think anybody's really topped that audio design for Shodan for, for a character voice stream. It's, it's really interesting, that kind of creation of that nightmarish feel in FPSs generally, like, you know, coming from Doom as well, you have that kind of nightmarish feel and it's, it's, it's something that really stands out. And, you know, other games, they go for ultra realism, stuff like that. You feel like you're in like a military kind of simulation. Um, was that edgy feel or something that you really wanted to, you know, get into? Yeah, I think my games have always, the games I've worked on have always been a bit 
I was never very interested in realism, you know? There are a lot of games that are, you know, that want to get, you know, exactly, you know, how, you know, a Colt 1911 and 45, you know, 45 caliber pistol works exactly. You get the kick exactly right and they go out to the range and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll test it and everything. And, you know, we made a game called SWAT where we tried to do that, but that was never really my thing. I tend to like more exaggerated reality. And so I think oh, I was- Overworldly kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the great thing about audio is it can help you identify a space, especially back then when the graphics were so low resolution, like System Shock 2. I remember showing it to my parents and they didn't even really understand what it was because it was so visually rudimentary games back then that unless you grew up as a gamer back then, because, you know, you guys are, I don't know how old you are, but there, I mean, gaming wasn't back then. It's not like everybody played games. Like only the weird mm. nerd kids played games. Like there was like four or five kids in the school who played games. I'm sure we probably all share a lot of like, you know, personality traits in terms of our ability to make friends and everything like that. It was sort of a nice, uh, it was a, a, a oasis, you know, for weird nerdy kids because it, 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 it addressed the kind of like fantasies we wanted to have, you know, where we weren't some weird nerdy, you know, eighth grader, you know, but some powerful figure or, <laughs> or cast into a strange world. And I, I think that, the visuals are so rudimentary that you really had to use your imagination. But the audio, once you had, like the jump from System Shock 1 to System Shock 2 in terms of having that really realistic sounding audio, or at least, you know, sorry, not authentic sounding, like realistic, you know, we weren't trying to make totally realistic spaces. Though we did, you know, endeavor to make the the ship that the game took place on, the, um, the Von Braun, feel lived in in a way that shooters weren't doing at that time. You know, that there were people who lived here and they, you know, the very small stories, love stories and family breakups and, you know, business stories about competition and business and ideological struggles and medical experiments going wrong, um, people losing their humanity. And, you know, remember, we're all in-house voice actors pretty much too. So, you know, we really didn't have, you know, I didn't have access to like these great actors that we have access to now. And there's some, you know, embarrassing voice acting, including myself on System Shock too. Um but I like the combination of the, you know, craziness of what was happening in the many and showdown with the very sort of quotidian problems that people were facing on the ship, you know, their day-to-day lives, their business rivalries, their romantic problems, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about Bioshock. That game, you know, when, when we got to the, the mid-2000s, such a massive game. And I remember, you know, one of the first real games that I got into on the the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 when those consoles came around. I spent hours on that game. So let's talk about when you first thought about Bioshock and the idea and how was it first proposed? And what, what, kind of talk us through the initial stages of Bioshock. It, it really came, I think, from a desire of people on the team who joined Irrational, either who worked on System Shock 2 or came afterwards, that they came to work on games like that. And we weren't making games like that at that time because... But Sister Shop 2 didn't make any money, right? And I was the guy who had to like make the payroll work, you know? And so I was pretty hesitant to, well, A, you know, you go out and pitch these things and usually you have to make some kind of rough prototype. So you're committing a, a reasonable amount of resources. At the time we had like zero money to doing this and you have to then finish it up with, oh, and it's, by the way, it's sort of a spiritual successor to this game that didn't really sell. And there are a lot of journalists and a lot of um, executives, junior executives of the company at these at the publishing companies who who love System Shock Two. And there was a million guys who went into their office trying to sell Bioshock. I was nervous about it selling, and so I was nervous about making it. But finally, the team convinced me to basically fund an internal prototype, and we made it. And I took it out, tried to sell it, and it didn't go anywhere. And so I was ready to sort of throw in the towel on it. And I think it was bummer for everybody because I think that's why they came to the company. But, we, you know, we we're working on like Tribes Vengeance and we we're working on SWAT 4, which are fine games, but they weren't what people came to the company necessarily to make. And I was so desperate just to keep the business going because it was, it, was it was a day-to-day struggle to keep the business going. Like I, 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 I do not miss that part of my job where I had to raise money. Um, now for which I work, you know, since I sold the company, I don't have to do that anymore. But that was, that was like massively high stress. So, but 
I wanted to make that type of game. The team really wanted to make it. I was just tempered by my worries about the business side. But I had this idea, kind of weird idea where I'm like, okay, there's this great book, which I, I still draw insight from, um, called Adventures in the Screen Trade, that a screenwriter who wrote like all the President of this man, this is in the, from the 70s, um, and uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. A lot of your audience may not even know those movies, but um, he was a well-known screenwriter named William Goldman. And he, um, they might know Misery. I think he wrote this screenplay to Misery. Um, and he had these two rules about Hollywood. And the two rules were, Nobody knows anything, which means none of the executives trust their own opinions. They're always looking to other people to validate that because that's why you see so many copycat stuff like, oh, we're going to have our own superhero universe, right? Everybody is, oh, we're going to have our own universe. And, it, you know, everybody tries to do their own MCU and, and they all fail because it's a tricky formula to get right. So that was one rule. But the other rule is, um, oh, sorry, nobody knows anything. And that, that was the main rule that I reacted to. I was like, okay, well, what if I can make art of how can I make people seem excited about this? And that would help the executives convince themselves and their bosses that there's something there because they're seeing excitement, not just in them and somebody outside. So I, I, I knew a journalist, Andrew Park at um, GameSpot. And I called him up and I said, Andrew, look, why don't you come out to the office and you can do a, I think he had mentioned once to me about doing a System Shock retrospective. But you could also do an article in this new game we're working on called Bioshock. And I don't have a publisher at this point. And he came out and we did that article. And like the next day, the phone started ringing off the hook because this was the nobody knows anything thing where all of a sudden everybody was getting interested in it because they read the article. And it was sort of by convincing GameSpot, which is, you know, um, one of the biggest, two biggest sites at that point to cover it, that gave it a stamp of approval and very shortly afterwards, we were able to set up a deal for it. it. It must have been quite a hard thing, you know, trying to get the press involved in a in a game with like an Art Deco style and a, a, a background based on literature and, uh, you know, in a world with FPSs where they weren't that, um, you know, um, that intelligent. I would say that actually, no, the journalists were very, like, so what A originally didn't have the art, we didn't even have the Art Deco style. We didn't have Rapture. It was a very rude, it was a almost, it was, and I, it was a whiff of an idea of a game. Okay. And when we took it out originally, it had like this, it was about this World War II underwater base off this island of Nazis were still, it was as a placeholder because I didn't have that much, I was, you know, trying to run the business. We were working on three games at once and I didn't have that much time to work on this thing. So we sort of said, it's, you know, basically going to be a system shock to spiritual successor. And the details really changed. But I think once the press saw it, I think they got quite excited because I think it allowed them, I, I think there's some, I never had the problem with, like, I think there are some people, especially at that time, who kind of, especially people, like people went to journalism school, who might be a little embarrassed, been a little embarrassed to be game journalists because it's like not, it's not like you're the Washington bureau chief, you know, or you're covering movies or something like that. You know, you're meeting Tom Cruise. It was a, rinky, a pretty rinky dink industry at that point. You know, it was not, it was still, but the weird nerds mostly, it wasn't nearly mainstream at all like it is now. And I think that the fact that Bioshock had some themes that were a little more, you know, for lack of a better word, a little more sort of elevated or informed by different references, like more by literature or, you know, politics or whatever, I think they saw that as great because then they can say to the people around them who they might have been embarrassed, you know, to say they're working on games, oh, but see, games now can do this. And frankly, I never cared. Like, there's a lot of people who feel like we need to show people that games can be X, Y, or Z. And I never cared that games were goofy, like that I'm a, a duck, you know, or a frog jumping across a, a road onto logs or I'm um, Hubert or whatever. I just had fun with them. I was never embarrassed by them or thought they were anything but a valid, I mean, even valid, valid mm. by valid by who? I just needed to be valid by me. But I think a lot of people struggled at the time because the games weren't, didn't have a lot of social cachet. And I think Bioshock was, I can't read minds, but I, I have feeling a lot of the reasons they were attracted to it because it elevated, you know, quote, elevated the themes a little bit over say, you know, like Duke Nukem or, mm. or Doom, but I never mind Duke, Duke Nukem or Doom. Like I didn't need the elevation. I was mostly writing from a place of the, 
the, I had a weird eclectic taste, but you know, I wanted to do was little different things, but it like, it never stopped me from playing any game. I don't think any games are dumb or, you know, because they, they're, they're not quote sophisticated. Yeah. There's, there's some awesome, uh, uh, slug fests and kind of, you know, titles. Yeah. 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 And you know, there's no shame in that. Well, I guess, you know, the advances in technology must have helped as well. You, you know, you go from system shock two in 1999, you know, just half a decade later with Bioshock, you know, stuff like water effects was something that, you know, in the late nineties, it felt like the technology struggled a bit with, but that kind of came into its own around that time. And do you think that helped with the atmosphere and the, the immersion, maybe stuff that wouldn't have been possible, you know, five years earlier? Bioshock was the game where my parents could look at it and say, oh, we understand what we're seeing here. It's not a bunch of abstract shapes. I see it's a art deco, you know, restaurant. And that was huge. You know, I think that the the Xbox 360, et cetera, that generation could render believable looking spaces that it, with just a little bit of imagination, you could push over the edge to really get immersed in. If you weren't like a weird nerd like me who could get immersed in the Ultima Underworld graphics. Now you go back and play Ultima Underworld now and it's very crude looking, right? It's kind of hard to get immersed in now, but um, I could, but now pretty much anybody can be immersed by the stuff we're doing because it's, you know, the rendering technology is such that it's pretty sophisticated. And did, you know, uh, the first time you saw Big Daddy, how, how did that kind of happen? And was it great to have kind of a such an iconic image for the series? Yeah, you know, the game design really started with the concept of the Big Daddy and Little Sister um, as a design concept. But I think it was Nate Wells who did the first, I still remember the first Big Daddy sketch, the guy in the diving suit. And it evolved a bunch from them, but sort of this, the humped shape of him, you know, where he, he doesn't really have a head. He's got it, like his face is in his belly, you know, or his chest. Nate caught something. Nate was also very good at, he had a really keen eye for industrial design, which I think a lot of people in the games industry struggle with. And that's why you see a lot of technology. Sometimes it doesn't look very believable. Nate had a really keen eye for industrial design. So the character looked very believable, even though he's fantastical. And the little sister, the concept was there, but the design for the little sister came much later, sometime later from ours named Rob Waters, um, we went through a lot of concepts. Like it was like a a, a bug for a while. It was like a it was like a monkey for a while. Uh, it was all these different things that weren't right until we got the little girl concept. But I think the little sister. As soon as I saw that picture of the big daddy, like I knew what I wanted conceptually. And I think Nate was the guy who thought of the diving suit. And once I saw that drawing, you know, it's probably differs somewhat substantially from the final thing. But the basic silhouette was there, and that. That is, you know, incredibly important. And the vibe was there. One um, aspect of Bioshock that really made it stand out was, you know, turning the player, basically turning the player into a weapon with genetic modification. Where did that idea come from? You know, and we had this concept in, in, in um, this hybrid concept in System Shock 2 that you'd have like these sort of psionic powers, you know. It, we didn't have left-hand powers back then. It was basically like another weapon you equipped it. So you had sort of magic spells, essentially, because we were making an RPG, but we you know, obviously we wouldn't have magic spells. So we had these psionic powers. <laughs> in Bioshock, we wanted something similar. I don't remember what the chicken or the egg was, but we knew we wanted it to be central to the storyline of the game, you know? And so, you know, I was thinking about the Randian stuff, about how there should be no limitations on the human endeavor, no regulation. And I thought, well, what if you had this technology and there was no regulatory body, you know? this incredibly powerful technology and what it might it do to people and why it become the dominant, you know, economic driver of a city. And so I think, I don't remember exactly where the idea, we knew we needed magic spells basically, but we didn't really have a, you know, we, I think then the, I can't remember if we thought of this being a critical part of the story first, or we just thought, okay, well, it's probably genetics. How about that? And, um, you know, we did a tiny, I did a little bit of research on that stuff and, um, you know, Actually, that guy may well helped again. He's the one who came up with the term plasmids because he did, unlike me, he didn't fail biology. I think he was pre-med at one point. And so, um, you know, we were off to the races. Well, uh, Bioshock Infinite as well was just absolutely amazing. But that was that was another huge gap between the games and a, a growth in technology as well. Um, you know, developing Columbia, uh, th- did that really help, that kind of change in technology? And I know... Um, some of the consoles kind of struggled with it a bit because it was so advanced. But um, 
you know, the PC version really kind of worked well. Yeah, that was, that was, you know, another generation. Um, and, you know, we have this idea for, you know, the opposite of a city, you know, a city that looks very different than Rapture and, you know, rendering it to seem like it was floating in the air presented a bunch of challenges um, because I didn't want the just things being static in the air because then it would look like what it was, which is a bunch of platforms hanging in the air. Um, but that was a kind of technological trick that the team built. Like um, it was a very clever piece of trickery, essentially. Like it, nothing was really floating. Um, um, I don't know if any if the guys ever talked about the methodology. If they haven't, they should do a talk on it. It was very interesting and hard to do. And we wanted big open airy spaces, which is the opposite. But you know, the the other big technological challenge in that game was Elizabeth, you know, this companion character. And that's I at that point I was really attracted to um I was really attracted to characters. You know, my, my favorite part of Bioshock was making, you know, Andrew Ryan and, and Steinman and Cohen. That's something we didn't really and well, we had Shodan at System Shock too, but she, you know, so I, I inherited that character, very fortunate to inherit that character. I really loved writing that relationship, that sort of frenemy relationship between you and Shodan. And, you know, then I got more interesting relationships in Bioshock. And then I was like, okay, well, let's really do a relationship. And that's where Elizabeth came from and really center her as the, as the main feature of the game. Um, and that was really cool. You know, the only downside was you got to know her really well, but you couldn't really make any impact on her. You know, she didn't really get to know you in a meaningful way. And I think that's what led to, you know, our thinking in Judas is we really want to have characters who understood you as well as you understand them, or at least, you know, more than we've seen in, in our previous products. Well, we'll definitely get onto the new game, Judas, in just a moment. Before that, though, I mean, I, I was reading recently that Bioshock is set to become a, a Netflix series production. They're going to be turning that into a movie or TV series or so. Have you had much involvement in that then, or any involvement at all? Are you looking forward to watching it? Um, I've got, I have had a very, like, I sucked. I met with the guys like once. Um, and I, I just, I just don't like, I can't really work on something casually, you know? So I don't, you know, I don't really have time to make a movie because I'm making games, you know, and I actually really like making games. And so I don't really know what's going on with it, you know? So, and I tried not to be, sm I, I try not to be a little involved with things because I don't think I'm, that's where I'm any good. I'm not a guy who oversees like 50 projects. You know, I'm a guy who gets really deep into a project. And um, so I don't, I'm not really involved. Well, uh, a project you've got really deep with is uh, Judas, which um, we, we've been seeing footage of all online. Uh, could you tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, there, we just did our, we'd done a couple of trailers for it and we just did our first um, big press event for it. So the coverage came out last week, I think two weeks ago. Um, and you can read a lot about there. We did something with IGN, this thing with um, a, a YouTuber called Skill Up and, and, and his, and his um, and they have a, a podcast called Friends Per Second. And um, also Jeff Keeley came out to see it. And um, we were really, you know, I, I went out that much time, you know, I'd probably get a much better description in my, in my, you know, in that interview. But um, it's basically character, character, character. How do we make, put the player in another one of our worlds, you know, a fully, you know, if people find our worlds to be sort of more fully realized, I think they'll see, you know, the sort of the next ver you know, the next fully realized world from us, which is a spaceship called the Mayflower colony ship orbiting Proxima Centauri after, a plague, after they left Earth because fears of a plague that would wipe out all of humanity. Of course, we COVID didn't happen. We did, COVID hadn't happened when we came up with that plot, but um, t life has a way of catching up with you. But the core there is really having the game pay attention to everything you do on a on a fairly granular level, and having characters who can be have that knowledge of you and interact with you, calling out things you've done very specifically, and having evolving, challenging relationships with these very complicated, messy characters that were a two-way street, not just a one-way street. Because Elizabeth is essentially a one-way street. Like mm. she would just follow you along. I had this one notion, uh, and I talk about this in the interview, but there was one point late in the development on Bioshock where it's like, God, it'd be really cool if Booker could just become so violent and so awful that Elizabeth just says, well, screw you, Booker, I'm out. But there was no methodology to do that at all in the game. Like there was no version of the game that didn't have Elizabeth at the end. Mm. Um, so we really want to start from the ground up and make a game where 
character could get disgusted with you. You know, a character could bail on you. And, but to do it in kind of way that nobody had done before, I, you know, I, we have limited time, so I can't get into all the details, but if they yeah. want to hear my talk on it, you know, you can just do a search, you know, go to IGN and see the interview I did there or, or for, um, and they have the two trailers out. And yeah. that'll give you a pretty good sense, way better than I can describe here. But again, I think we're building upon our world building and really pushing on our character interaction because I love characters. I, I, yeah. I, I love creating interesting characters, challenging characters. And so most of our energy has been how do we make those characters leap off the page at you and let you interact with them in ways you, you know, they've never been able to in our games before. Yeah, and I'll obviously link the trailer in the show notes. You know, anyone that loved Bioshock, I think, will be in love with this game by the looks of it already. Um, yeah, we, we, we definitely, the first audience we always want to please is our existing audience. Yeah. You know, because we're very loyal to them and they've been loyal to us and we want to make sure we're making a game that takes the things they love and goes further than what we've done before. Each game has sort of been an evolution, a, a big evolutionary step. This one's reasonably big step because it's taken a long time. That's one of the reasons it takes a long time. It's a bigger step than what we've made before. Any idea when it's going to be released? Is it, I think it'll be this year? Or? We have not talked about that yet. <laughs> right, fair enough. But people were able to come to the studio and play five, six hours of it, you know, mm-hmm. and all have their pretty different experiences from each other. There's a lot of right. content in the game now. Um, but lots of content, lots of pow, pow, balance, polish, all that kind of stuff to go. Fantastic. Well, can't wait to play it, Ken. Um, best of luck with it. And thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing some of your memories with us as well. It's been uh, wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, fellas. Mm-hmm.